Welcome back to another episode of Bitfinex Talks. I'm your host, Ricardo Martinez. Today, my guest is a very special guest, uh, Jiraj Bednar. Uh, he is the co-founder of the legendary Paralani Polis, which is a crypto anarchy educational center that's based in Prague, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he's also the author of the book, Cryptocurrencies, Hack Your Way to a Better Life. And he's agreed to come on the show to talk about crypto anarchy with us today. Jiraj, how are you today? Yeah, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I'm super really? excited to have you on here, man. For uh, people that have been in Bitcoin for a while, like myself, uh, it's a great privilege to have a legend like yourself on the show. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, I wanted to start it off with, for those that don't know what Parallel Nepolis is, can you kind of explain what it is and what the motivation was for you to be involved with being a co-founder for Parallel Nepolis? Sure, I was involved uh, with uh, with an art group uh, called Stohoven, and we were doing, uh, still are doing some kind of uh, hacktivist art. And for some projects, we were starting uh, to use Bitcoin because it provided uh, anonymity back then. And we were, uh, me and my friend Pavel, uh, were constantly talking, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin, it's uh, it's gonna change the world. And uh, when you talk to artists, which uh, most of the members of the group are like visual artists and sculptors and uh, filmmakers and, and, and so on, they want to get practical. So they say, okay, you nerds, uh, we know that uh, you like this project and you can send funny money to each other, but uh, can it actually be used in the real world? Is it something that, you know, you can pay with, maybe run run a space with and or a business or a nonprofit? Like, is it something that you can actually use it? Um, that was actually 10 years ago. So <laughs> uh, if you asked me um, uh, back then if it was usable money, I would say no. It's like uh, ju just to give you a context, uh, context uh, first customers were usually paying with their laptops by uh, scanning the QR codes uh, with, the, with their uh, laptop camera with Electrum wallet. So uh, they were like not even like uh, uh, Bitcoin wallets on iOS and so on. So anyway, uh, so we uh we uh when, when you are <laughs> interacting with uh, these megalomaniacs um, who who want to try something out so what they did is they signed a contract for a three-story building in uh, um in prague and uh what they uh what they did is okay uh, we will have a cafeteria and we will only sell coffee and other stuff in the cafeteria for bitcoin so there will be no other option and uh, this is a way how we can introduce people to, to uh, this parallel financial system because they, they will have to get go through it so the original idea was we'll have the best coffee in prague and then of course uh, if people want the best coffee in prague <laughs> Uh, then, uh, uh, then they will have to go through this uh, through through this ritual and uh, exchange um, uh, fiat money uh, for Bitcoin. So up to this day, you can only pay, uh, pay with crypto in this space. Um, there are other parts. Uh, there's a hackerspace. There's a co-working space. There's an institute of crypto anarchy, which uh, is uh, an educational institution uh, and uh, also organizes the, um, uh, the congress that we have and uh, some some other events so that there is there are many moving parts but basically the question is okay can you run uh, uh, okay it's a non-profit but still it needs to be sustainable it's uh, uh, like if you if you go bankrupt because uh, bitcoin falls 50 percent then then it's not usable as, as a basis so uh, so we actually consider it um, um, in a way like a business. You need to you need to be sustainable. You need to make more uh, than 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 you spend. Otherwise, um, it's a it's a feedback from the market that uh, that it's not uh, sustainable. So one thing about the name, because that is something that people understand the least. Uh, it refers to uh, to. Uh, communist uh, Czechoslovakia and the idea of how to how to live in a very repressive society, very uh, very authoritarian society, 
uh, and uh, it's a strategy. So most people, when they when they say, okay, so what do we do with an authoritarian regime? They would say either you know change it from inside, you know, kind of in that case it would be join the communist party and you know uh, be better and change it from inside, influence uh, how they make decisions. Um, another extreme is revolution, which um, is kind of difficult to organize, especially in a in an authoritarian society. Um, and it's uh, violent and uh, usually not not a not not a good strategy, uh, although it turned out uh, quite uh, fine in the case of Czechoslovakia. Um, it's called Velvet Revolution because it was not violent that much. Uh, so this uh, this third strategy is uh, that you say, OK, I accept that I live in, in an authoritarian society and uh, I do everything that I absolutely have to do, but I uh, want to build parallel uh, societal structures, so uh, parallel education, parallel markets, parallel in this case, in, in the case of um, uh, parallel Nepalese and Bitcoin and uh, the crypto space, uh, parallel financial system is what we are actually building. Um, then, uh, then you have parallel information exchange and so on. So, I'll give an example that people can imagine of what this parallel society might be in practice. And a very, uh, very easy explanation is okay. Uh, you have an educational system that is mandatory. You have to send your kids to school and you know that they will brainwash them with this communist propaganda that they were, uh, you know, Marxism, Leninism and all this, all this stuff. If you don't send your kids uh, to school, the state will take them from you, force them to go to school and, uh, you know, uh, leave them to state foster care or, or something like that. Um, so you don't want to do that. Uh, but nothing, um, uh, there, there is no reason not to organize um, another education in the evening in someone's kitchen and teach them about, you know, classical liberal values or whatever in, in the case of uh, communist Czechoslovakia, maybe religion, uh, that was something that was not allowed, uh, at least not openly. Um, so we create this parallel solution, so you don't go against the system, you don't try to reform it, you don't try to uh, turn it over, you just build something better that will outcompete this societal, uh, this, this space for these societal needs that, uh, that it's supposed to provide. So uh, we are trying this in parallel police and the reason uh, it is uh, the, the 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 name on the building is Institute of Crypto Anarchy because we realized that the crypto anarchy is uh, basically building this uh, Czechoslovak strategy um, in uh, on the internet in the in the uh, uh, in the in the space of the internet with uh, anonymization technologies encryption and so on so you can build this parallel society. Now we have, uh, for example, Noster, which is a, which is a decentralized uh, censorship resistant social network. So, okay, you don't like something about Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. Okay, you can build, uh, build uh, a parallel solution. So uh, what is interesting, it's not alternative, it's parallel solution. So you kind of count on the, the mainstream idea uh, to, to still operate and, uh, and you are, uh, so you're not replacing, you're outcompeting by building something better. That's very, very fascinating, especially the history behind it, like with the way that the Czech people were like creating black markets and stuff to to trade, you know, in these parallel structures that you're that you're talking about. Prague seems to have like a really strong grassroots cypherpunk kind of culture. First of all, Parallelly Police was started there. Uh, I think Slush Pool was also started in Prague, Trezor. Uh, was started yes. in Prague. So there was like a lot of like very strong Bitcoin adoption in the very early days of Bitcoin. Why do you think that is? Well, it's uh, interesting because uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, Czech and uh, Slovakia, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia uh, had uh, quite a tradition of IT. And uh, this combined with uh, this uh, uh, experience with authorities and uh, 
kind of a mistrust of the of the system and even even after the velvet revolution you know it was not uh, super shiny when a when a communist regime collapses and um people who have no idea how uh, like a western liberal economy works you know there were that there was like uh during the the 90s it was you know um uh, quite <laughs> wild capitalism and and um, uh, it was like all the institutions were being uh, being built uh so so we immediately see okay that when, when there is uh, or at least uh, this part of uh, of it um uh, it geeks uh, we have seen okay on the internet it already works you know we can we can already have these uh, peer to peer interactions we uh, we can use encryption. So these are technologies. That's what that's what the cypherpunks uh, were working on. Okay, these are the technologies to to build the parallel society. And because we have seen, uh, first of all, how it looks uh, when you live under authoritarian authoritarian regime, then you know the wild nineties. Um, you realize, okay, I I need to have a have a have an alternative, a parallel system. That is not controlled by these guys, and by these guys, I don't necessarily only mean uh, mean the government, uh, the the government, but uh, also you know that the, there was extortion, there were like these mafia groups, oligarchs, and all these things. So, um, so I think uh, that is uh, that is uh, one of the reasons. Another uh, reason, which is uh, uh, also related to history, is. Um, that we didn't have a, a free currency exchange uh, in Czechoslovak crown and uh, and uh, it was quite interesting because uh, when people were uh, allowed to travel uh, abroad which was not easy especially to the west, uh, to the west and when people from the west were visiting um, visiting Czechoslovakia um, they couldn't easily uh, exchange uh, Deutsche Marks and US dollars to, to local currency uh, and, and back. Also, we had uh, another parallel currency, which was actually uh, sanctioned by the, the state, and it was used to buy imports uh, uh, from, from uh, Western countries. So if you wanted jeans or something, you couldn't even buy it with the Czechoslovak crowns. There was a parallel currency that was called Boni. So uh, you had these uh, people that were um, basically OTC dealers. Uh, we have called them backslags. Uh, I, I like to use the term. Uh, right now you have, uh, for example, in Argentina, arbolitos um, and uh, and uh, other, you know, street currency traders, basically. So we had this experience. Okay, uh, the the state is probably not not the best provider of these uh, services, and you can go around with a uh, in a decentralized way. So we are able to bring this into um, uh, into our lives uh, and uh, found value in it because uh, uh, because you know, okay, even if um, if the state completely banned uh, Bitcoin. And that's why I'm very optimistic about Bitcoin's future. Let's say uh, all the all the big exchanges are completely banned. Let's say in one country, you, it immediately you can you can see um, that because there is demand for Bitcoin, these people come and you find a way how to buy Bitcoin even even without it. So uh, so for us, we had this experience because we realized okay, this is decentralized, so it's not possible to ban it. It's not possible to control it. Uh, and we know that whatever the government does, we will be able to use it. So so, uh, so because of this experience, I think uh, that, uh, that we were kind of um, primed uh, to, uh, to be more interested in it um, than, uh, than some, somewhere else. You know, um, Bitcoin, like, now we live in a, in a, well Czech uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia are now in European Union everything mostly works although it's kind of declining but you know when you want to send money into someone using a bank uh, account it arrives the next day you know it, it usually works 
but not many people have this experience uh you know when when you want to send money let's say from panama to to the us you know immediately you get stopped you know money laundering and all these things if you want to exchange money in argentina if you want to take your money from china there are um there are so many people on this planet that have a bad experience we had a uh, historical bad experience but we knew that there are ways around it so so i think we have seen the value of this because we said okay if we had this uh in the in the 80s let's say uh it would uh, it would improve our lives a lot and there are many people on this planet who will who will want uh, this experience and who will want this parallel financial system because they're mainstream financial system doesn't work at all so or or has some serious limitations yeah i agree with you there just for context like when was the velvet revolution i'm a little ignorant to to check history like how long ago did all this take place and um, november 1989 so it was just before the fall of the soviet union the uh, which was 1990 uh so so that that was the revolution then it took some years to actually uh to actually uh, switch to some kind of market economy one interesting fact when i was talking about the street currency dealers when uh, czechoslovak uh, crown was um, uh, was uh, finally freely traded they actually went to the street dealers uh, to ask what the exchange rate should be because the central bank didn't know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so the street dealers were actually the only people who knew what the real, real worth of uh, of the currency is. So, um, and then uh, in 1993, uh, Czech and Slovak Republic split. So Czechoslovakia split into Czech and Slovak Republic. So that's kind of a brief history. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you guys go through any sort of like hyperinflationary currency crisis during this time of transition, like we see in Argentina or like Turkey or, or other places like that? No, thankfully not. There was a monetary reform, but that was way before. Uh, we we had uh, double digit inflation, similar to what we uh, experience now, but uh, it was not that crazy. Uh, but uh, there was a lot of uncertainty but uh, it was not about uh, not about the currency that much well, there was inflation which hurts but uh, but uh, not hyperinflation or or like long uh, long term um, long term inflation that's kind of like a, a perfect segue like giving the background and, and the historical reasons for why the Czech bitcoin community is so strong it's it's kind of a perfect segue into your book uh, cryptocurrencies hack your way to a better life because your book kind of deals with using cryptocurrencies to route around some of these uh shortcomings in, in the economic system and and also with personal freedom can you describe like what readers can expect from your book sure sure uh so one of the one of the things that i wanted uh, to explain is actually how you can use uh, bitcoin uh, that is volatile many people people say that uh, that volatility is an unsolvable problem it's not possible to use it in a business because you know you will go bankrupt if you use it as a, as a main currency um in the same way uh you know that that's the most common thing that people would say about uh, uh, about bitcoin also in personal life you know why why are you saving in this crazy thing you know you can lose all your money so uh, over the years we have developed strategies on how to deal with volatility first of all and also how to how to make use of volatility so i explain um, a few of the strategies there and um, uh just that you know i'm i'm not a trader i don't know how to predict future price so all this is based on the fact that i can only see what bitcoin is worth today and i cannot predict because uh, uh i i don't do trading courses and i'm a really bad trader <laughs> thankfully i tried with uh, with not a lot of money lost it all and <laughs> and uh, and uh, i'm i'm basically using strategies such as uh, short uh, intervals you know saving and expanding time horizons and so on 
One of the strategies that not many people use, um, and it's very useful because uh, it has tax advantages, is using uh, collateralized loans. This is uh, something that uh, that I promote quite a lot. You can do it, uh, of course, uh, in many ways, even using derivatives. Uh, but um, basically, uh, if you want, if you need to spend your Bitcoin uh, because you need to buy something, a car, vacation, or you need to invest in your company, uh, uh, it's um, it's uh, th this is usually the moment when people have to do a decision. Okay, I'm selling Bitcoin now, and the current price is this one. And uh, I think it's better not to sell your Bitcoin and uh, use it as a collateral and just take out the loan. Then it doesn't matter much if you know we are in a bear market or a bull market. Uh, of course, you need to watch the value of the collateral. But uh, I think this is a very good strategy to postpone any decision uh, for selling Bitcoin. You can keep uh, keep uh, the the value and um, this way, if you are borrowing fiat you're actually shorting it because borrow means short um, so if the interest rate is lower than the current rate of inflation you will have to work less uh, in the future uh, to return uh, uh, the, the loan so it's actually a, a good way to profit on the on the fact that uh, that we are living in a in a world with inflationary fiat currency so for example this is one of the strategies um, so uh so i also look at uh, what kind of uh, new opportunities there are what what people are doing um how to accept it in your business uh, why this uh, why uh, why so much fuss you know because uh, with most people you know they install a wallet they find a way to to buy bitcoin send receive and then they say okay how does this improve my life okay should i just hodl and <laughs> and wait or is it something that that i can more actively use what about these decisions what about taxes and um and so on so um so i try to be quite practical but it's quite a long book so i also uh covered topics such as uh, mining and environment and all these things that people are usually um usually you know uh, that that's one of the points when when people say oh i don't want to use bitcoin because it uses proof of work mining so i kind of also uh tol talk about this and i i think it's a very useful uh, thing for the for the grid and bitcoin can actually help uh, uh to to move us to a more uh, renewable sources and sustainable energy so so this and also I talk about uh, parallel societies, parallel police, and the, these regulations and regulatory hell and what to do about it. And it's pretty optimistic. So when when you hear words regulatory hell, it's not you know it sounds like a horror book, but I actually have a very positive message. I I see that um, people all around the world when when they find themselves in in uh, such an environment they find ways how to how to deal with it how to tackle it and uh and uh, uh how to improve their lives despite uh, the uh despite the environment that uh, that is around them you've been in bitcoin for over a decade right and i know that parallel me police is not like like a bitcoin maximalist space so so to speak i know that they also accept other other coins and stuff like that. What projects are you excited about right now in our current crypto landscape? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I can't uh, speak about all the people in Parallel Police. There are many Bitcoin <laughs> maximalists uh, in the in the space and in the in the community. So we are not uh, super uni united uh, in in this. But me personally, I'm of course uh, Institute of Crypto Anarchy means that uh, uh, I have to. Uh, be interested in privacy uh, because that's one of the crypto anarchist strategies so i really like uh, monero uh, i really like uh, lightning network which brings uh, privacy allows scaling allows uh, instant payments uh, and so on um, i personally really like uh, other applications uh, of um, uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies 
such as collateralized loans and uh, even uh, prediction markets. I think prediction markets are, are a fun way to use uh, cryptocurrencies to uh, get better information and um, and uh, make better decisions in the in the world because when you when uh, it's not about the poll where where someone votes but it's uh, actually something with skin in the game you tend to get better information uh, i also like um, uh, privacy projects uh, that uh, don't necessarily need to have uh, cryptocurrencies uh, in them but I really like uh, Tor project, uh, NIM project, uh, encrypted communication systems, uh, censorship resistance. I really like Nostr, which uh, kind of joins social networks and uh, and Bitcoin Lightning payments. So all these things uh, that allow us to have more sovereignty uh, and are actually practically useful it's not you know moving money from one pile to the other pile or making new piles of tokens but that you can actually use to somehow improve your life your business and uh, and your condition uh, regardless of where in the world you live and what what regulatory environment you find yourself in Aside from your book, I, I really enjoy reading your blog. You you always write very thought provoking articles. Would you mind giving Thank out you. like your your blog address to the audience, and then also your relevant uh, social media links that people can follow you on? Sure, sure. So uh, my website is uh, my name, which is Yurai J U R A J dot uh, Bednar, which is my last name B E D N A R dot I O. Uh, or you can find it also on hackyourself.io. Uh, there you can also find my English podcast that I'm just uh, restarting. So uh, hopefully there, there's going to be uh, some new content quite soon. Um, also my social media, you can find me on Nostra uh, for sure. That's uh, a little bit harder to find, but you will find it on my website. I'm not going to spell the public key. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a Nostra identity, but I don't remember it. Um, but uh, also, uh, you can find me, for example, on uh, Twitter or X, I guess. <laughs> um, and that's uh, handle J U R B E D. One last question that I had for you was: uh, Are you familiar with like the the idea of temporary autonomous zones? Yes, very much. <laughs> Okay, I was wondering if you if you've done any work like in that area and like establishing uh, temporary autonomous zones like in the community. Uh, so in Europe, uh, there are quite a quite a few of these, and uh, it's very inspiring. Uh, we have uh, started uh, uh, Parallelna Polis, uh, which is spelled differently in Slovak in Bratislava, and there's one also in Košice. And uh, in Bratislava, the problem uh, was that during uh, COVID, uh, we had to cancel the rent. It didn't ma di make sense to rent a building uh, for us uh, because we would have to pay rent and not be able to operate anyway. Um, so we were um, we were thinking um, uh, on how to how to create this temporary uh, like a version of a temporary autonomous zone. Um, uh, like an instance of parallel police uh, as a temporary autonomous zones made out of shipping containers, which is very cool because um, when you have any kind of problem with with land, with landlord, or even with a with jurisdiction, uh, you can just uh, you know order a service that will move, uh, like uh, trucks will come and they will move your whole place, and you can build amazing structures with shipping containers. Um, in Bratislava, this is even nice because Bratislava is a city that is um, at the border of um, of uh, three countries or three three other countries are pretty close. So you can take a bus and you're in Austria. You can take another bus and you're in Hungary, and a little bit farther you are in Czech Republic. So you can take everything, your capital, everything that you have built, and and move it somewhere else. So this didn't happen, but we uh, we kind of organize uh, as a temporary zone um, in another shipping container place in uh, Bratislava. Uh, so we just had a Lunar Punk festival there as as Paralnapolis in Bratislava, 
And in Prague, there is uh, another very interesting project, which is called Decent Track. So it's a, it's a track that is basically a super compressed version of Paralnipolis. So if in your city, you want to uh, to host an event, onboard people to crypto and so on. There, uh, you can you can get a track to go there. We often go to festivals and uh, other events, and it just parks there and creates a like a pop up temporary autonomous zone, which uh, uh, which uh, uh, it basically um inside is uh, where people sleep and there is all the equipment but outside you can have uh, talks on the screen you can have a, a outdoor cafeteria with like fancy coffee there's even a bitcoin atm a lightning atm machine uh, which is called blesscomat which is an open source project that was started in parallel police in prague uh, so this is this is a way how you can create this kind of pop-up autonomous zone um and this is pretty cool uh, because uh, um, many uh, people who oppose uh, these parallel societies they're quite slow they need you know warrants uh, judges and uh, you know all the all the machinery is kind of slow so uh, so by the time that uh, that uh, someone who doesn't like you can act you are already somewhere else if uh, I, I'm really glad that you mentioned this topic. Uh, so, uh, so for the listeners who don't know, I really like uh, Hacking Base uh, TAZ book. I don't know if you, if you heard about it, if you, if you know it. Um, TAZ is a temporary autonomous zone. It's an it's an American philosopher, and uh, it's a beautiful book. It's uh, it's like a it's it's basically an artwork uh, like a, like a poetry, and it talks about these uh, temporary autonomous zones. And there's even on YouTube, you can find a few chapters that are turned into like a musical album. So it's not even an audio book, but it's a, it's a song uh, that is basically reading uh, these stories from the, uh, from the TAZ book. And you can learn about temporary autonomous zones that, that way it was done by Bill Laswell. So if you, if you want to listen to some music uh, and, uh, um, and uh, learn about temporary autonomous zones and kind of the vibe, of the philosophy i highly recommend checking it out yeah i do too i'm familiar with the book but i actually first came across the the idea of temporary autonomous zones from uh, smuggler and, and frank braun when they were doing their cypherpunk bitstream podcast they had like a i don't know like a three hour long episode about about it and the one that they were setting up in berlin which was super interesting to me and made me investigate the the topic more but uh yeah thank you for for coming on the show I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to to come and talk about crypto anarchy with us. Thank you very much for having me. Bye. -bye.